Um, yeah, no, I apologise. I've had flu, so... But having looked through our training diaries, like John just said, I know that I was ill for two days on the 8th and 9th of December last year. And it's now, what, the 4th? Yeah, exactly. So I know I'm not going to be ill till May, because that was my other two days off. So apologies for the voice and things. But at the first presentation I want to do, <coughs> having spoken to Sean, I was kind of saying, you know, I'm happy to do something, but what do you want me to talk about? And he said, well, considering you made quite a big jump last year, just um, I want you to tell coaches what you did. Because I don't think often enough over here we actually let coaches and athletes know exactly what people do in training. So I'm going to, there'll be no holes barred. I don't mind, you know, giving training programs out. I mean, I think, you know, you could do exactly the same schedule, you know, one athlete and the next, and it might not have any if, if effect on them at all, partly because this was very indiv individualised for me um, and is based on my training this year, having moved back down, back home, to work with Mark, who apologises profusely, but he's got a family weekend that had been organised about six months ago. Um, but it was it was based around <coughs> the best bits that he'd kind of picked up and that I'd picked up from East German schedules, um, kind of watered down by about 30% due to not taking various substances. Um, there's a lot of uh, Finnish influence because I've spent for the last, since I was about 18, I went over there first of all and met up with um, Mikhail Ringberg who's kind of at the end of her career now um, but she'd medalled at every kind of championship not being incredibly tall incredibly strong we're kind of similar um, physically and have similar thoughts technically and then obviously some stuff that I've done with Steve and Zlesny type things um, which have come in as well which helped Mark tremendously but because we're so different it's been quite nice in that he was physically immense and six foot four and you know he if you looked at tables he'd be yeah I think he was world record holder wasn't he for uh, for a quad trust like he's I mean unbelievably plyometric and strong etc so but I'm different and um, I'm I'm a bit more agile and coordinated where his his strengths were strength power type stuff so um, if we go back um, to September last year I was kind of heavily pissed off after a bit of a shitty season um, so they were, I've just written them out of my training diary, they were my aims for two, 2007. Um, so throw, I wanted to throw 63 because um, I thought that was what I was capable of and it's kind of pushing for, well doing well at any kind of champs or any Grand Prix and throw over 60 regularly because generally you don't have to throw much further than 60 in a qualifying round to make the final. Um, and then it will improve all round dynamic um, and growth strength. <laughs> Um, I seem to be split from the waist upwards. My upper body is very plyometric and quite strong, but my legs, because the way I'm, I'm built, I've got a very long kind of quad, so getting into set positions for lifting, I find quite difficult because my legs are a lot stronger than my um, kind of upper body, which is very short. Um, but I just wanted to imp improve my kind of dynamic strength more than anything, but knew that my growth strength, I'm always very paranoid because all the top girls in the world you know, I'll always, we'll always chat together about what we're doing, etc. And you compare lifting um, between us. And I know Oberg Fall can back jerk 120 kilos, but then her technique is quite ropey, but she's thrown 70 metres. So I always find you can learn something from everybody. Um, whereas Watakova actually isn't very strong for her height and her, um, you know, her weight. So, um, but she's very good at bounding. But I also know that Oberg Fall's coach is a plyometrics coach, not a Davin coach. So she works a lot on bounding and plyometrics. Um, and then thro improve throwing technique um, to be more consistent. So I just wanted to be more consistent and improve everything, <laughs> basically. Um, partly because I didn't really start lifting till I was about 19. Um, so what I threw when I was younger was purely just from a good technique. And I did have a very floppy shoulder, which I, I want to talk about a bit later on. Um, but as you get stronger, um, you do have to work a bit more on mobility, which is something I'll do later on as well, which I'm doing a lot now um, because I think it helps all sorts of different problems and it's something that is kind of overlooked. I'm not talking about just stretching because I think everybody does that, but specific um, flexibility for throwing. Um, so in terms of training, um, like Steve talked about, um, it's just all about balance because I wanted to improve everything and obviously you've, in throw you've got to be able to run you I mean I, I think something that's not really worked on too much is is bounding and jumping and plyometrics 
um, and obviously strength and um, medicine ball, which I do a hell of a lot of. Um, so we were working on a um, three, week, three weeks on, one week testing. Um, we've, we've tested, well, we tested a lot this year, which we will do this year as well, um, to try and um, reproduce kind of getting into character and testing. It's something I'm not na naturally a particularly aggressive person. So I, found, I used to struggle with that and find it really, really difficult to kind of, I don't know, get go very inward and get the kind of go from the depths of your belly type things but now when I'm testing I'm screaming shout I'm in the gym I couldn't I couldn't care anymore so it's kind of practicing that on a regular basis and, and testing every fourth week so we test um, we test clean snatch pull over bench uh, three bunnies standing long jump overhead shot 30 meter sprint so kind of a quad test and then you can test standing throw which I don't think a bad thing to test ultimately you haven't got a run up but it's a good test of what your arm's doing I think so um, when we started um, basically in terms of balance I think I never got too far away from or basically the program or the weekly kind of program stayed kind of similar and there was a sim similar um, components every week um, I only actually lifted twice a week for pretty much the majority of the year but I was getting stronger and I was putting the weight on pretty much every session so I was improving so rather than I mean I have done in the past lifted three or four times even in a week I, I, I lifted uh, three times in the week in the strength block which lasted probably about four, four to six weeks um, but I never got too far away from all the other things so they were so basically um, in September when we started I just did a block of I started very very early I only had two weeks off from the previous season and got straight back into it but just did circuits which I think is important if you've got kind of an overweight athlete you hear people going for steady runs and things and I think that's pretty rubbish really because you get very dead and it's you know it's quite far removed from what actually we do whereas if you do circuits where you include CV type stuff I do a circuit just um, one that the general public do in Cambridge where you do um, go through kind of 22 stations and there's CV equipment in there so you'll blast a rower for about a minute and a half and your heart rate will be kind of 180 or so when you get off, but it stays that throughout. And then you'll do, I put in all the um, kind of balancing up the muscle groups exercises, so reverse flies. Uh, for, for shoulders, I find that reverse flies and protraction, retraction, which is, um, I'll have to demonstrate, is um, it's kind of like a, a press up, you probably can't see, but you protract your uh, scapula, then invert it. So you're just strengthening the, um, the lats um, leg extensions because of knee, knee problems um, and, and just various jumping exercises. So you, you're just keeping your heart rate up all, all the whole way through. Um, I mean, I still do some steady runs, but that's more of a kind of flush out. Um, and also treadmill sessions. And what I mean by that is um, they're kind of inter interval sessions on a treadmill, which is also good for you. You are absolutely knackered where you almost fall off the treadmill. It's something I think Mark got from, I um, can't think of his name now. Tim, Tim Newnham, um, which I think he thought was very good for lifting if you're doing a lot of reps, is you'll just ramp up a treadmill, if you put it on kilometres per, per hour, ramp it up to about 18, 19 kilometres an hour, and the treadmill's going round and round and round, and you literally just have to hold the size, jump on and run for, um, I was doing 30 seconds on, and then jump off for 20 seconds, just split your feet ap apart. So it's kind of, you have to have a bit of balls to kind of get on and run. But it, and you do that 10, 10 to 12 times, so 30 seconds on, 20 seconds off. And you're not actually, you're only running for, what, five minutes, but you'll find your heart rate and your kind of work rates at such a, a level that it's much better than going and running. But it's, it's good anaerobic kind of work for lifting and the fitness for kind of a high volume of lifts. And also in the kind of pre, I think Mark called it like a transitional stage into training, I think he thought I was going to be a lot more unfit than I actually was, but because of a kind of team sport background, I was okay. So, um, and swimming, uh, just various different strokes. I do about 30 lengths of front crawl backstroke. Um, and then also, because I, I think it's quite good for shoulders and then some abductor adductor exercises. So swinging, because you've always got that resistance in the water and then some shoulder exercises because um, you've got constant resistance rather than bands that I think are good, but not quite as good. And then just general sport as well, just for general fitness, agility, coordination. 
And then on, in October, we went into, I did, actually did, um, I think, three sets of eight in a couple of weight sessions a week. Uh, and the main exercises we do and will continue to do are just the, the norm, basically the normal things of clean, <coughs> back squat, bench. Um, I think chin-ups are very good. Um, snatch, which I do from hang because I'm just more explosive from there. Uh, single leg squat, pull over, um, push press. We're going to do a lot more uh, behind the head jerking this year just because I think it's quite uh, an important exercise. And I would say in terms of female javelin throwers, I think um, because we've had, you know, we have had obviously good female javelin throwers, but not for a while. And I think the upper body in female javelin throwing is, is almost more important than the men's event because I think because the implement's a lot shorter than the men's version, I think you can get away with a lot more. You'll see some incredibly ropey techniques on, you know, well, any champs, um, but because they've got such brute force, and I mean, I've got a relatively strong upper body compared to the rest of me, I can pull over kind of 80 kilos and bench 95, which is good for majority of javelin throwers worldwide. So um, I, think, I think it is very, very important, especially pecs for girls, because I think they're quite under, underdeveloped generally, and you hear that talked about um, around the world just to improve the upper body strength for female javelin throwers. Um, and then I was ball throwing uh, in, in October uh, about 100, well, 50 to 60 um, on the end of a medicine ball session. Um, Mark wanted to do overweight and underweight, but never get too far away from actual throwing speed. Because I think if you throw heavy balls all the time, it becomes quite a slow movement. And if you think of the speed of um, the, the movement, when you actually come to throw it, you need to still keep in contact with some fast throwing. So he'd often do underweight as well as overweight. Um, and then medicine ball, which I think we probably do a bit more of than um, a lot of people. Um, I mean, I'd do two medicine ball sessions, which would be about 200 throws. Um, I'm quite happy to go through medicine ball exercises, but I think it's kind of shown a fair amount. I mean, obviously in October, you do the more conditioning ones um, and then get more specific as the season goes on. And the, the reps tend to be, I mean, I'd probably do about six or seven exercises about 10, three times 10, 10 to 12 reps each. Um, and then I'd still keep a circuit in, in the treadmill session and the um, general sport as well. Um, and I wasn't throwing then, I was just throwing ball throwing, but we were doing a few bits off run-ups or shorter run-ups um, doing ball throws. And then come November, December, um, I went up to four sets of eight doing weights. I mean, it seems like quite a lot of reps, but bearing in mind my strength levels for kind of clean snatch uh, weren't particularly good so I needed a big base because often when you now we've got strength conditioning coaches coming in and everything um, not a lot of them tend to do um, like a large amount of reps and all stick to threes for technique and power and work around power ranges but I mean I, I maintain that I've got stronger just from doing a massive base of um, sets of eight and fives and stuff and then go to threes um, later on um, still two medicine ball sessions then I started throwing um, but when we start throwing, I think when I see a lot of people throw or come into throwing sessions, I mean, Mark got me literally from, cut me right back down to basics and I started a throwing session. So we'd, I think another thing which was important last year was throwing volume. My throwing volume went up massively and we were um, throwing uh, probably um, one session, if we were throwing twice a week, it went up to three times a week. Later on, I think about 50 to 60 throws a session, which is quite a lot. But a lot of that's standing, so it's not going to be too damaging. But I'd start off front on from there just to create range and get strong through the hips and in a balanced position. And we'd throw front on just to get kind of the elbow going over the top, which I'll talk about um, later on, which has helped me. And just the rotation of the shoulder I'll talk about later on. Um, and then, and, but still circuits, treadmill, so the, the fitnessy stuff going through. And then the December block, um, up until Christmas, I'd go back, I'd go to 6543 and then three twos, heavier, um, two med ball sessions, and then specific weights are brought in, which I think are quite crucial. And I'll go through a session of specific weights exercises, which I got from Finland, um, which I think because everything's in, in a very linear, when you're lifting, when you're doing clean snatch, it's all very front on, very linear. Whereas, you know, javelin throwing is, you know, creating as much range from your right hand to your left foot and in quite a contorted position, which you never ever get into um, doing uh, kind of gross strength training. So I'll just go through, I think it's about 15, 20 exercises. 
which just get you specifically strong. So it's using light discs and, and dumbbells, but I think if you get good at anything, I think that's quite a good thing to get good at. And then we start to bring shot, shot throws in. I mean, if you watch Latvians train, they'll do sessions of it um, where they'll do about you know, 150 shot throws in a session. And I've always thought, well, I don't really see the point, but because um, it is quite far removed from javelin, but it's a very good all-round explosive movement. And, and the one shot throwing exercise that I'd, I've never seen anyone over here do is overhead forwards, because everyone does overhead backwards, but I've never, I mean, people might do it, but I've never seen anybody do overhead forwards, which um, I'll do later on, but it just means throwing a 2K shot overhead, so overhead, but forwards, but you're creating Unfortunately, my laptop crashed, so I've got video footage, but everything's been wiped. Um, where you're creating almost, you touch your, your, you touch your heels with your, with your hands, so you're wanting to get into that, so get in and out of that position very, very quickly, and it gets you much stronger throughout your core and right up from your feet to your hands. And it's just, I find, I found that was another thing that really helped me um, get strong in a kind of out of range position. What weight? Uh, 2K. But I wouldn't start doing that until you've done uh, a lot of medicine stuff. So you could start, um, you know, seated, then go to knees, overhead forward, and then standing overhead forward with a medicine ball, which is quite different actually to a shot, and just um, progress up that way. But I do think that's a very, very good exercise. And I can throw overhead forward further than I can throw overhead backwards, which is probably more relevant. Um, and then, and then January was just ramping the weights up. So. I'd go up to five, four, three, two, one, um, at kind of 95% weights wise. Um, and then still the two javelin sessions, med, ball, med balls and hurdles were kept in. I'm sure you've kind of seen the hurdles exercises, but you can develop those and have, you know, javelin above your head, across your shoulders, just so you're getting stro strong through um, the core again. Um, and then I'd be doing two specific weight sessions um, a week as well um so which i'll show later as i said and then uh february time that was kind of when i was away in um uh, south africa training um i've got a good photo sequence actually from south africa which it was still on my laptop uh, and then february i was gonna, gonna i was always going to do the european throws uh, challenge which is in a kind of warmer part of europe um in march just to see where i was at so in february i kind of had my mind was thinking, well, you know, I'm going to be competing in March, so I need to start taking my run-up back and getting comfortable off a um, full run-up. So then we'd start doing run-up sessions, and Mark um, is very keen on um, using elastics, so pulleys. So I do run uh, 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 crossovers, jump crossovers. I can show you them later. It's quite difficult in here. Um, with some resistance, so then you really get your legs working. Um, so I do that before I started throwing. Um, and, and then the balls started to get a bit lighter, um, but I'd still have a kilo ball in, but I'd do, say, five sets of five with a kilo ball, five sets of five with a 500 gram ball, um, just so you never get too far away from the fast throwing, still keeping the specific weights in. And then I went to, I um, can't remember where it was now, some horrendous part of Eastern Europe to throw at um, European throws. The weather was awful, but it was a good chance to just to see where I was at, and I threw um, just over six, I think it was 602 there, throwing pretty badly actually so that was quite a good sign that things were going in the right direction um but my run-up was all over the place which is kind of expected at that stage um and then i came back and i could had a bit more of an idea of what i needed to work on um to improve in the season um so we carried on with the whole balance of the training again i went back into a bit of a conditioning -y type thing so a bit more circuit work uh up the medicine ball again um, and then Mark tried we tried just um, coming down a bit to do some more fast faster weights which I don't respond to particularly well I, I like either very heavy or kind of power range 80% for threes whereas I don't work too well off kind of dropping the weights and doing very fast sets I, my body doesn't seem to respond to that for some reason so um, so we'd start doing um, the kind of faster stuff for the comp and then back into conditioning afterwards um, and go back down to well, five, four, three, two, ones again and then keep the throwing up and the shot throwing and the agility session, so bounding, which, I mean, bounding is one thing that I'm going to do a lot more of this year, but I just hadn't been able to because I've had a knee problem for 
about three years. I've always had to kind of train around that and kind of manage that problem. And then come April time, I went into specific power work. And for me, if we we're talking about going from quality to quantity and how training affects the body, I seem to respond incredibly well to power work. And it took me three weeks from, from starting the power work. So that was um, kind of squats and then jump squats. Um, and we'd do timed, timed bench press, so I'd do six reps. I think Steve had a slide there, 10 reps at 60 kilos. He did in about seven seconds. I was doing 60 kilos. Um, six reps I was doing in about four seconds. I just seemed to, my body seemed to respond very, very quickly. This was just prior to Luffer in May. Um, so, and this, and I had the best two weeks training I think I've ever done in my life in April in uh, Portugal. And I did, I think if I look at my training diary, I did nine PBs in a week in the gym. Um, overhead forward shot, I think I did about 1750 or something. Um, standing long jump, which I'm not very good at, um, but that was all going up. Um, so, and, and I did three throwing sessions, I think, because my problem was always qualifying. I could do final throwing two days later. I just didn't feel conditioned enough and resilient enough to throw further again in a final. So we were practicing throwing back to back, basically. But I threw, um, so I threw on a Monday, Wednesday and Friday, and we kind of had just six competition throws in all of those sessions. And I, I threw 64, no, 60, 20 on the Monday. I threw 60, 60 on the, mon on the what, Friday and threw, I think 58 off um, seven strides in the middle of the week on the Wednesday, but I was still training round that, so I was lifting, bounding and everything else. So I knew that I could throw back to back come the champs, well, I thought. <laughs> um, and so that was the, the best kind of two weeks, um, about, that was about four, four weeks or so before the Loughborough match. So I knew going into uh, the Loughborough match in May that I was going to throw a PB. I had no doubts I'd throw a PB. I kind of thought I'd throw about 62. But when you are in such good shape, like Steve was saying um, a bit early, you can change things. And I was able to, I was on the run up and I, it was just, everything felt like slow motion. So I could change every throw. We kind of just tweaked a, a few things, just seeing what was working. So we were still learning and still kind of developing. And I, I could come the last round, I was just going to work on, I can't remember what it was now, but I think just keeping my left side a bit longer and, and then went 65. So we were like, oh. And then from that day, I thought, well, I, I, you know, it wasn't fantastic. And I knew there were things to improve on, like I could increase the pull a bit and the timing could have been better. So I thought, well, you know, this year, I then had to change my kind of goals. And I thought, well, I could go 67 um, with too, without too much um, problem because we hadn't really tapered for um, competing yet. So, um, but then about a week later, I was lifting, doing too much like I've done the last couple of weeks, which is why I'm ill. I'm a bit silly sometimes, but I did learn from that Well, I thought I had. Um, and about a week after Loughborough, I was lifting and I was tired and I was, I think it was the last set of, um, I was doing clean pulls, I think, because I couldn't clean and catch because of my knee. So I was doing clean pulls, just got in, I was tired, got into a bad position and rounded my back a bit and lifted. And it just went, but, and something happened. I don't know what, but I carried on the session like a silly person. Um, and then it, just went horrendous and I, I couldn't work I thought it was muscular because it I've done that before um, but then it turned out that it was a disc problem so um, I was kind of having it treated and I just couldn't lift very heavy so I had to lift it kind of 60 percent and um, I couldn't jump or do anything particularly explosive but I could train around it so for from then on I went to Glasgow through well again but I just wasn't throwing as well as I knew I could um, and just I was piking in the middle um, in Glasgow, and I wasn't very happy with how I was throwing, but it's still, I obviously carried over Loughborough into Glasgow. And then for the next nine weeks, I just couldn't train properly, but I was still training. And then come July, um, um, I was, I think it, it was actually uh, the day after my birthday, I was on a scanner, because it was starting to go, this back problem, it was supposed to be a disc thing, um, but no one really quite knew what it was, but I was gonna have a cortisone in it just to calm it right down. And I was lying on a scanner in London, um, and, and this guy said, he, he said, oh, you know, I'll go and take the scan, then come back in and uh, I'll uh, inject to where, under ultrasound, I know I need to inject was where the problem is. So he went out, had a look on the scan, came back in and said, I would inject, but um, they do know you've got a stress fracture. So then I was like, I was like, it was a very surreal moment, actually, because I'd, um, it was my birthday before, so I sort of seen some friends the night before, I had no battery on my phone because I didn't think I needed it. And uh, then I... Uh, <laughs> walked out of this hospital in London with my scans under one arm, no battery on my phone, 
and uh, like my uh, kind of travel card in one hand and sat on the bus and I was just, I, I'm not a crier, but I was in tears, it was horrendous. And I, had, I couldn't phone anybody, so I had to kind of borrow some stranger's phone to tell Mark and tell my physio what had happened. They were fuming, or Renee, my physio, was fuming because the scan had been missed, that it was a stress fracture. But then I was shut down for a week, then it had to be investigated. It turns out that it wasn't a current stress fracture, it was an old stress fracture. So the only time I've ever thought that I'd ever hurt my back before was when I was about 15, so I could well have done it there. So, but I've got a fracture straight through one of my L5 or something. But it's, it's not a problem, I don't feel it, so I just think if it doesn't hurt, just get on with it. <laughs> but um, anyway, come three A's, it was fine again. I was told that I can carry on the season because I was told season over, then it wasn't season over. So it was all a bit um, kind of knuckering emotionally. Um, then come three A's, I was like, well, great, you know, I've got a second chance of a season. Um, and I did a week's training and seemed to respond, obviously probably having had that bit of rest for a week. Um, and 363 again, um, I think actually one of those throws would have gone further than 65, but the wind kind of just killed it. But it was quite a good throw technically, I thought. So then I thought, you know, I'm back in, in it again. Um, and then about 10 days later, I was tired from, I think just emotionally tired and, and probably could have done with a few days off. Um, which is obviously why you need to listen to your body and, uh, and, and not do too much, especially in the season. Um, and I just, I was lazy on, from my right to my left foot and just stuck my left foot out and caught my Achilles. So then I couldn't do anything on that for about three weeks. So basically come, come August and come World Champs, I just had nothing in my legs. I couldn't, I had an injection and I couldn't do anything on my legs for about a week. So before, and what I found personally, I mean, I know Steve and I know well, Mark especially because they're, you know, six foot five, very strong, or much stronger than somebody like me. I find I have to train in the season and keep um, relatively, I like to feel quite strong. And I think, I think that's similar for most female athletes, quite strong and with a bit of tone in the muscles where I know Steve and I know Mark like to feel very floppy, very loose. Um, and come August, I just had nothing in my body whatsoever and I just couldn't. I was very flat on my feet and I just had nothing to kind of give. So that's why that kind of all went wrong. But I think I could have handled it better in that I thought we'll go very relaxed because I knew that, you know, that things, it was probably the worst month of training that month compared to the rest of the year. So I knew it wasn't great, but you can't tell yourself it's not great. So, um, so I, I, got, I went the other way and I went very relaxed thinking, you know, when I'm relaxed normally, I usually throw a long way. But instead I needed to be very aggressive and just kind of bash the javelin, which I'm a very timing orientated thrower. So I think if there is a break in the chain somewhere, it kind of scuppers me a bit more than other people, which is why it's good to have a relatively um, good level of kind of brute strength to get out of jail sometimes. So, so that was kind of the year. Um, you know, I'm quite happy to tell people exactly what, you know, if you want to know any kind of training secrets. They're not really secrets at all. It's just, I don't think there's anything. I, th well, I just think the key is just hard work, but, but sensible hard work. And, and like Steve says, going into sessions, trying to get something out of them. And also, Basically, everything you do in training has to be related to what you do when you throw. So, especially things like medicine ball. I see people doing medicine ball sessions, and everything's really short and just not very connected, and you're not getting any tension through your abs, and it's just very different to what people are doing when they throw. But then they probably throw like that as a result. So, everything that I'm trying to achieve when I throw um, is is done doing all the other types of training as well. Um, I just want to. That was. I was doing this ill yesterday. Um, but what, I mean, I, I felt made the um, difference for me last year. And it, and it was quite difficult for Mark in a way, because we I'd always trained with him, and I'd know, I've known Mark since I was 13, so he knows me as a person incredibly well. And like John says with Steve, I mean, I can, I, I often, basically through the whole year, I'd ring Mark up and say, you know, I've been thinking about maybe putting that in, all this in. And he said, oh, I was just thinking about that today, or you know, we look at each other and I, I can say, I'll say one word and he'll be saying the same thing at the same time. So we're very, kind of know what's going on between the two of us very well because we've known each other for so long. Um, but I think the main, th well, obviously the main thing for me was Mark. Um, it, it just worked from kind of day one and I knew within about two weeks that I was going to throw a long way. But I think I saw Mark pretty much every day, um, probably five days a week for my main session every day. I'd work around his lunch break so he could see from the start, for the first couple of months of training, he was picking at things or he'd just tweak things in, in everything I was doing from weights to medicine ball to throwing. He'd just 
tweak things slightly in, in everything. So, but now, I mean, training, starting training this year compared to last year has been completely different because he's hardly had to say anything because I, I now, it, my body knows what it's kind of trying to do. Um, technical changes, which I'll talk about um, in a second. And I've got a couple of bits of video, the only bits that are actually on my laptop, which crashed um, just from, you can probably, it's kind of a spot the difference exercise. Um, and just, I was able to, or through Mark's planning, basically the volumes just changed subtly, but all the same exercises were in there from day one. It wasn't taking things out and putting new things in. And um, it, was, it was very similar, but the volumes and intensities just changed, obviously, as they should throughout the year. Um, so the training was very progressive. Um, and obviously, like Steve was saying, the balance. So nothing, there wasn't anything that was more important than something else. I mean, I've always been very paranoid, you know, I need to get stronger, I need to get stronger, and I'm always told I need to get stronger, but ultimately, um, I need to get better at, you know, bounding, and that's, that's kind of key for me, I think, um, but just getting better at everything. Um, and, and working on weaknesses, I mean, I can't jump for anything, <laughs> so, um, but, but I can, I'm starting to be able to, I think now I look a bit more like I can actually jump, so. Best Our best standing long jump now is about 250 but it wasn't, it was 220. I mean, I was awful, really, really awful. But I could throw, so, you know, I wasn't too bothered. <laughs> um, testing, um, testing, I think, was key, the whole getting into character thing. So every four, fourth week, it was quite exciting, because it was, because everything was all, all exciting for me last year. It was, um, you know, it was, it, was, it was a good chance to see how the training had affected me and whether it was right, because there were stages in the year where I was like, I don't feel that this is, particularly beneficial, especially when I went to kind of lifting heavier um, for some reason. It, it, I could lift a lot for, um, you know, sets of eight, but it wouldn't really translate to the uh, to kind of twos and ones and things. So sticking around threes was good for me, but um, we had to kind of change things as we, as we went along. But that was what was good uh, about having Mark there at most sessions, because he could see how the training was affecting me. Um, and I think a big thing was the increased throwing volume. So, because ultimately the thing that conditioning, conditions you best for throwing is throwing, but not throwing balls necessarily, throwing javelins. I think a lot of people do ball work, which I think is good. Um, but I, d I don't think, um, I think it's very, very different to throwing a javelin. Um, and basically I cut out all the rubbish that doesn't make you throw a long way. I think nowadays phys physios and things have come into it and giving people 10,000 rehab exercises to do and as much as they're not particularly knackering when you do it It's all more training to do and I think it's easy to get um, Hung up about you know sitting on a Swiss ball and and doing all that when ultimately that doesn't make you explosive and powerful It might help if you've got an injury then yeah, you need to rehab it But I don't think there's an awful lot of point in doing tons and tons of preventative stuff I mean I put it into circuits, but I put it in and add it on to other things that are um, the other training that we're doing um, right, technical changes. Um, this is a clip. I mean, this is the only. I had three video clips left on my laptop from it being. Um, it just crashed one day for some unknown reason. So this is from 2006, I think Europa Cup in Madrid. I mean, I did throw particularly rubbish that day, <laughs> but I think it's quite um, obvious as to what um, what's kind of got better. I can't actually play it through the PowerPoint. I'm going to have to play it on the, uh, just on a Windows media player. Um. I'll just play it through a couple of times. I don't know if that is in slow motion, but it looks very slow to me, but I think it might be a bit. But all I see on that is very flat-footed, hips are quite low. Um, I'll go through to technical changes and I'll explain it a bit better. There's no kind of um, gap. There's my left arm is quite low. Um, I'm dropping my right hip, which has always been a problem for me. I'll explain that in a minute. But I mean, I don't like particularly what I see. Losing it at the end, it's not very nice. Um, hang on a second. I just come out of that, sorry. That wasn't on my desktop before, but <laughs> I felt I had to put it on. Oh, 
that was posed. Okay, so um, the technical changes which Mark was quite keen to make. Um, I mean, it's something Steve was talking about earlier on about him liking like a rigid, well not rigid, um, tension in the right arm. I'd go the opposite and I like to be quite relaxed. Although you do, uh, having kind of a bent, a bent right, a slightly bent right arm, because when you actually come into strike, it strengthens, it straightens anyway. So just having it relaxed means that, for me, this is my personal view, this is why it's good to hear different opinions, because it might not work for you, but making sure the hand is behind the um, right shoulder, because you see a lot of people running in with it out here, so the only thing it can do is elbow go down and come out the side. So make sure it's in, in or almost behind, behind the right shoulder, very relaxed, because I find if, if it's relaxed, then you can create that kind of plyometric ability with the upper body, rather than it being very straight and tense and then you kind of pull in with your shoulder somehow i just don't respond particularly well to that but in terms of left arm left side that was i think one of the key things that i felt changed things straight away was in the last uh, final crossover or impulse whatever you like to call it um just lifting that up that uh, left arm up i just thought about lifting it up i mean i know when mark was throwing he, he used to like to look at his um watch on his wrist but lifting that up just lets you get your legs underneath. And I think about now presenting my left oblique. I mean, Mark doesn't explain it like that, but it's, he'll say that to me now because that's the way I think about it. Um, so just, just showing, showing that presenting the um, left side as you come into throw. A, because that, having that left arm across the body will it allow you to use your right arm and, and keep that so it doesn't come out to the side. Um, and I'd, I'd done a lot of running work the previous year and I got very good at running and I was posturally very good but it was very up and down so very kind of, I mean it's kind of like Steve throws but it worked for him but for for me it, um, it didn't it didn't seem to work as well I get I kind of jump, run up and down on, on the spot almost so it was a relaxed running closer to the ground so my knee knees wouldn't come as high but it just meant that um, my feet were very close to the ground so I was covering the the floor much quicker um, and also not over striding because my legs in the last video kit were quite far out in front of me and it just means you get stuck so basically Mark was very um, you know feet underneath you and not not inside yourself but over your over your right right knee and just travel the ground quite relaxed with feet not I have a habit of flicking out my left foot so just making sure that I'm running past my left leg so it's always creating um, that good kind of left position and not dropping a right hip so previously I'd always whether it was a strength thing whether it was just something I always did or whether it is something that happened in the setup beforehand but I'd always drop my right hip down so so basically then everything's going down and your chest is going down so then you're not going to get the um, kind of elevated um, flight so now I'm trying to work on which I think having a pre-bent right knee is very important so going from low, low to high with your hips. Um, I know some people work on just having very straight hips the whole way through, but I think it's very difficult if you're high already in your hips to then go even higher. You can keep them at the same level, but it's quite difficult. Whereas if you have a pre-bent right knee, then the hip will go from low to high. So then that gets your chest up and um, the kind of good flights and ultimately good distance. Um, rotation of the right shoulder. Um, is something that we've done a lot of work on and will continue to do a lot of work on in that um, uh, I mean Steve was very <coughs> straight straight kind of arm and, and almost looked like he was bowling it in a way because his shoulder was so flexible and stuff um, whereas it's something that I think um, I don't know I've never really heard it talked about too much but I always think about a good exercise is doing this is just, if with a relaxed right right arm, is just getting your elbow over the top, so rotating your shoulder, and thinking about getting your right right elbow to go up and over the top of your shoulder, because um, otherwise you're gonna. I just find you're gonna get elbow problems if that shoulder isn't rotating. Then the elbow is gonna drop and come down and round the side of your shoulder. So 
if you think about just rotating the shoulder over the top and just working on that kind of range and getting the elbow to go over the top of the shoulder, then that's going to help out an incredible amount. Um, and that helped me, but you do have to have specific kind of flexibility to do that. Um, and often you'll just see people throwing out the side there, and it might not be that they can't rotate their shoulder, it's just that their flexibility isn't adequate enough to get in that kind of position. And, um, and soft right knee there, by that I mean, um, I think you see a lot of people, it's funny actually when you watch English schools, you get kids rotating and screwing their knee kind of in, trying to get their hip in. Um, and something Mark's always talked about is just having a really soft right leg almost. So when it lands, it, it almost doesn't touch the ground or you, and there's no weight on it. So it's, because if you stand with a lot of weight and a lot of tension in that right knee, it's difficult. I mean, some people think of it, they want tension in it and they want to think about using it. But for me, I found that if I just thought about having no weight on it and a very relaxed right knee, like you can just flop it in. And when you're not trying to fight yourself to get that right knee in, if you just try it when you're stood up, just think about screwing it and it almost doesn't, your hip doesn't get all the way through, but if you just have it kind of pre-bent, very relaxed, and just let it flop in, it just goes straight forward without any effort, basically. And I think that helps the kind of plyometric effect. You get up through your whole body as well. And then I've just got ankles there. Um, through doing uh, drills, we'd always do drills before weights as a warm-up rather than kind of just running. I'll always do 50 minutes of foot drills just to strengthen the ankles. And I find skipping is fantastic. Actually, almost better than doing drills for weights. I've always skipped, so do kind of six, six times one minute skipping. It's good because it kind of connects the whole body and you using your shoulders a bit more as well. And you can kind of fix your scapula while doing it. So you can do, you just feel quite fixed all the way through the body. Um, I found that helped me a massive amount because obviously if your ankles are strong, then you're not going to drop your, your right heel before you um, strike your right hip. So that was a, that was a, key thing for me as well um, and then um, I've just got a couple of throws from I think one from um, where are we one from three A's sorry this year. yeah this year from three A's this year so um, you should notice that um, left side position so presenting that always having room for your legs to work underneath so if you present this left oblique your left side whatever you want to call it and it always running past your past your left leg then you can just cover the ground a lot more easily and I think you should be able to see that from this film and hopefully the chest going up I'm not sure it was the best row of the day but it's the only one I had yeah I think that was 63 um, I haven't got Quintic because it's crashed, so I can't slow it down. Um, and then, but I think from that you can see, you'll hopefully be able to see the ankles are a lot stronger. They're not dropping as much as they were in the previous clip. And also running off your left side, so getting a lot of time in the air on the final uh, crossover or impulse. Um, just sets up the whole throw. I, often the one thing that could be changed on a lot of people's throwing is creating better runoff or time in the air, however you want to describe it, because it just sets up the whole throw and, and enables your legs to get in and, and be used in, in the throw. And then there's just one more from Glasgow, which this was when my back was quite bad, but my feet, they would transfer, my legs would, uh, I was getting in and off my right foot quite quickly, although I had a slightly bent left leg, um, I was getting in and out of positions quite well and and, um, and my upper body was quite good. My elbow, if you watch the elbow, it's going over the top of the shoulder. So you get that hit off the top. It's not very easy to see. But. Um. So, um, where are we? Uh, 
Um, that's the photo sequence. It was the only thing I could get to kind of slow it all down from South Africa, so January of this year. Um, and you should be able to see um, the running in the first slide. Um, I was running past my, what, my weight's back, so um, you know, I've got a good layback or um, it's not leaning back, I call it laying back. So it's all set up, ready to go. And you know, my right's going far ahead of my left. I'm, my weight's back, but I'm not inside myself. And my feet are quite close to the floor. And then in the final crossover, it's pre-bent right knee and the weight's transferring quite quickly. I've always got, a lot of people do, I mean, I get quite stuck on my right foot and it's something that I think plyometrics are gonna help with um, the strength to go from right to left um, quite quickly. And then my left side is always up. So basically to, um, if you've got a, a shut off left shoulder, it doesn't really matter what you do with this left arm as long as that shoulder is shut off because I think it's key to setting up your upper body. And then um, it's being able to create, the chest is going up there um, and creating a lot of range between right arm and left foot. And my right hand is kind of behind my uh, left foot. So, I mean, that was off a kind of three quarter approach. So I saw that in January and thought, well, if I can do that at speed, then it should go a long way. And then the elbows going straight up over the shoulder in a good kind of finish off. So I thought I was quite pleased with that throw in January. It's helpful when it's warm though. <laughs> um, anything I would have done differently, obviously throwing better in Osaka, but um, it was pretty obvious when I was able to look back through training diaries and um, that's why they are so useful. It just was the worst month of training. I mean, I probably could have done more mental rehearsal just to kind of combat the effects of um, kind of pain inhibition, basically. Um, I wouldn't necessarily have started training so early, but it was just the, the way it was. I wanted to get back into training. And so this year we've started um, in kind of mid-October. So it's almost like a month. I'm a month behind where I was last year, but it, it's not because it'll even up later on. Um, and the Olympics are a month earlier. So in theory, I should be where I was kind of in June time in, in August. Um, I'm needing to get better at listening to my body. I've done too much in the last two weeks, which is why I'm ill. So it's, but then I did looking back in my training diary, I, exactly the same thing. This time last year, I was, uh, my mum had a rental property that some, uh, um, she managed to get some tramps who broke in and had kind of, lot, what are they called? I don't know, rights to lit squatters, basically. She had squatters in this and they absolutely trashed the place. And mum was distraught, so I thought, well, I'll go in and clean it out. So I cleaned out the whole of this house and got the industrial cleaner whilst training and kind of knackered myself and had got ill, basically, like I've done today. And uh, in, the, in the last couple of weeks, I just had a lot on outside of training. so. Uh, I thought I could get away with it, but I didn't. Um, so I've got ill now, but I'll be fine in a couple of days. Um, and my knee, knee this year has been a lot, lot better um, from all the rehabbing. It's a patellar tendinopathy on my right knee, which just means that the, the tendon's kind of degraded and damaged. And so you just need to strengthen everything around it to, to make sure it's fine. But it's jumping, jumper's knee. So basically that's why I've not been able to do any jumping for the last few years. But now I'm just doing a lot more bounding. So it's very simple stuff. So frog leaps, which is just going down into a very squat position and straight up, um, double foot bounds, um, single leg bounds, just on grass. It's very simple stuff, but it seem, seems to work for me. Um, this year I want to do a bigger comp block. Last year I was supposed to do that, but because of the back thing, I couldn't compete properly. I was competing, but not as much as I would have liked. And I was still training whilst competing. Whereas this year I'll have a bigger comp block in kind of June time for kind of eight weeks or so and not do that much training round competing, then go back into training. And, it, and then, I mean, last year, because I, I was training all the way through, I almost got sick of training because there wasn't that excitement from competing so much. So I was kind of training and it was all getting a bit kind of hard, like hard work when the sessions weren't very big. Um, so a bigger comp block um, this year <coughs> and then and, and I should be able to should be able to peak for um, Beijing. So, um, not yeah, the Olympics. Sorry. Yeah, no, this is what I would have done differently last year. So world champs, obviously, in you know, I'd love to have thrown further, but you, you live and learn. Um, so, so for this year, so I mean, the training will be pretty much the same. 
um, although the shift, uh, shifted time scales by a month um, from having started training a bit later. Much more jumping plyometrics, having talked to Oberg for, I mean, she does, she's very, very, I mean, her run-up is very fast, and if you watch her, she's very front on, which, like Manjani, the Greek, a few years ago, um, I mean, she is very strong, but she's plyometrically incredibly good. And when I spoke to um, Spotakova after the year before last, I said, you know, what did, she, what did you do differently? Because she went from, I think, 62 to 65. And, um, and she said, I was at my shins, I didn't have bad shins, and I was able to bound. So, I mean, it kind of gives you some idea of how important plyometric strength is. Because it's, it's another way of developing what you've done, say, squatting or in the gym, into, into throwing. Um, yeah, so more of a comp book. And, and the, one of the kind of important things I found this year is I've come away from last season, I had a bit of back, still kind of lingering back problems. When I first started training, I was worried because I was throwing, my first three sessions were horrendous and I was in, it was just nice, well, I was just in pain, basically in my back and in my elbow for some reason. I've never ever had elbow problem before in my life. Um, although it seems to be a kind of common theme amongst female throwers. If I think this year, Narius had an elbow strapping Mercedes Chiller had an elbow problem, Spotakova had an elbow problem, she had to get injected before um, World Athletics final and through a PB. But, um, and Obergfell should have elbow problems, but doesn't because she's so, th so strong. But it seems a common theme. But basically, this season or this year, I want to concentrate a lot on specific mobility, not necessarily well, flex flexibility, mobility. So there's a few exercises I can show in the high pack <coughs> later on that I've put into training. Um, around what I'm doing and actually doing sessions of it. So I've got two sessions of week, a week before I throw, say, the next day of specific mobility. So things like um, just with a javelin, you can um, just, just get into that position. So just flex, um, so you can push with, push with your left hand and just create that bow with your right. So that's a kind of specific stretch because it's, you know, it's very easy to, it's just do the normal flexibility of stretching your tricep, but you don't, I mean, it's not what you do when you throw. So it's good to do the general flexibility, but then more specific things. I've got stuff to open up your thoracic and, and that kind of thing to get in specific, into specific <coughs> positions. And the key thing I think this year is we know how the training affects me. So I know that um, doing, I can't hold my strength for a long time. So doing singles for me isn't going to be that beneficial, whereas it is for a lot of guys. So doing more power kind of work in the season for me will be beneficial. And I, I know from, you know, seasons gone, I don't take many competitions to get kind of competition sharp. I mean, Mark said, or Steve was, you know, 11 weeks for Steve. Um, you know, Mark, you say eight, nine weeks for him. Um, I could probably say about three days, pretty much. I mean, I seem to be able to go from um, going towards power, speed work. I mean, this year it was within three weeks, although I think I would have thrown further had I not um, got injured. But it's the first season I've actually, I've never ever thought that I could throw 70 metres, but having thrown 65, the way I threw it, and I didn't actually, it didn't feel great. I'd thrown a few throws better in training, but um, I've kind of thought, you know, it is, a, it is possible the physical, with the physical capacity I have. It's not huge like some of the other people, so I, I, there's a lot of scope. So, that's basically what I did. It's not rocket science. It was just very, very carefully planned. And I think Mark has got quite a gift. And it's a shame that he's not here because um, he probably could have explained it a bit more from his point of view because he could see it. It's very difficult as an athlete to see kind of how you've developed because you can't watch yourself throw and you can't see kind of what changes have been made. All I, I just felt like more of an athlete this year um, through all the training, for, through the balance of training that I did. So that was that. Um, next session... Um, I just want to go through some specific weights exercises. It's not, I'm not talking about lifting, I'm talking about small dumbbells, just getting into um, rangy javelin specific positions. They've all come from um, kind of Germany, Finland, um, and you know, they've got a wealth of knowledge in throwing, and it's, I mean, they do whole sessions based on um, creating kind of rangy <coughs> strength and positions out of range, basically. And then so I'll just go through some of the mobility sessions that I've been, I'll be doing for the next month or so. And I have a question. Yeah, no, if you've got any questions, feel free. Could you say a little bit about your men's for training? Mental training. Um, for, yeah, so, so mental, mental uh, training for competing. Um, from my point of view, I'm very much a um, confidence thrower, like I think everybody is, ultimately. 
in that coming into throwing a British record, I, I knew that I, I was stronger, faster, more powerful than I'd ever been before. And I was doing so many PBs, I just knew I was going to um, throw a PB. Um, it, it's funny, from Mark's point of view, he'd say something different. He said, like, at Glasgow, I mean, Loughborough's irrelevant because, you know, I haven't got the competition and stuff that I would have on a bigger stage. So come Glasgow, that was probably the real test, um, up against kind of all the medalists from the previous champs. And I do get quite, um, Mark would say I was really fidgety. I was mucking around with my bag and I was, bit, I mean, it was raining, so I was moving all my stuff. That was what I, my argument was. But I, I do like to get quite nervous because I find nerves are quite, not nervous, it's kind of anxious because I wanted to prove myself and I knew I could beat some of them. I didn't, I mean, I, I was thinking, you know, top three would be good. Um, but, and, and 63 plus, that was my aim. Um, so, I mean, I always work around, um, doing the whole see, um, see it, feel it, do it. So visualize, I'll get to, uh, or when I pick up the javelin um, before I throw, I'll see, see at the back of the run up, I'll just take a few seconds, really relax. I think that's the main thing. Um, see, see a throw through, play a throw through. It's something I've not always done, but I've been t uh, talking to sports psychs about. I, I've always, I always watch it leave my hand, but I never see it land. So that's something I'm gonna try and um, put in this year, see it, see it go, you know, 67 or whatever it is. Um, so see it, feel it. I mean, when you when you um, mentally rehearse, your body kind of kicks in. And whenever I watch myself throw on video, I always do that without realising that I've done it. And then and then I tend to jump up and down three times and really relax my shoulders. Um, and then go, and that's my routine. Um, but I, I think when you come into a champs, it's always a bit different because you have to warm up out the back and throw out the back because you only get two throws inside. So it's a very different kind of environment. But um, it's just having the same warm up routine. I think it's crucial at whatever comp you're doing. And I always think about, um, say for the Olympics, I'm just thinking back to the previous Olympics, say um, you just try and kind of do normal things because you're never going to be in a, at a championships, you're in a very different environment. If you're at home, say, and they're throwing at Loughborough, I'd come from home, driven from home, and I wouldn't be driving for two hours at Olympics, but it's just trying to stay very, very relaxed. And then when you get in the shower, that's when I kind of think, that's when all the, I always visualize it <laughs> in the shower, of kind of flushing away all the, like, lethargy, basically, because you can often wake up on a big competition and feel like absolute rubbish, but it's just your body kind of, preparing itself for something big that's about to happen. So um, I always visualize that's all the kind of lethargic bits of me just draining away. And then you start getting into kind of competitional mode or how Steve says, into character. So that's when, you know, you'll listen to your music. You don't really say much to anybody uh, at all. And I go quite kind of inward. And um, I mean, obviously the week before you're, you are visualizing a decent throw and, and what you want to do. Um, and it is things like not having that extra throw that you think is going to go further when it's better to save it, especially when you're out the back if you're, if you're warming up for a competition. I mean, I'd have, I wouldn't ever throw off a long run up. Um, I might come off a three quarter approach. I'd practice my run up, but not actually throw off the end, but just be kind of bubbling away under, under throwing a long way. <coughs> it was interesting in Osaka, I was throwing, um, I, was, I, I was throwing a long way off a three quarter approach. So, I mean, I, I thought everything was fine, and it completely was, but as soon as I took my run-up back in the stadium, because I had nothing in my legs, it got worse when I took it back. In hindsight, I probably would have gone off a, a three-quarter approach. Um, so, I mean, that, that's, that's something I'll do. I mean, I think in qualifying for this year, I'm probably going to have to almost bash, bash it first round. I've never really done that. I mean, John, you're always quite keen on doing kind of what you think is like an 85% throw, because with adrenaline, it's always going to be... 110% anyway.
And these, this, this girl in particular, in fact, two girls, the same group, was Trina Hattishad and her mate. And they were both equal at about age 17, 18. And what happened is Hattishad had translated the pick the knee up into throwing 70 meters. The other girl, who was just as good, translated the picking knee up to literally picking knee up. So all she did was that, landed and it went nowhere. So she went from 50 something meters the same distance to nothing. So you can see the effect, coaches are really powerful in terms of what you're saying and how you're saying it. And the crucial <coughs> issue is, again, it's that again, is the translation. It's what you, what you get out of what you say. And just be very, very careful, because you're really important in terms of trying to get that effect, if you like. Mm. I mean, one other thing on that right, right foot sweep. I mean, I was doing that, but you can get very straight-legged. So something I think about is just bending my knees at the back of the run-up slightly. I mean, it's an inch, literally, but I feel like I've got my knees down here and they're not. So it's kind of sweeping it through, but not with a straight right leg, because then you, yeah, that's landing on a straight leg and rocking onto your left, and that's when I used to get inside myself, and then my hip goes down because it's got nowhere to go. So anyway, back to the mobility. Well, back, well, back to the one more. If you say bent legs like Goldie, it's dead right. You know, yeah, she means she bent, means bent legs bent like, like it's yeah, a sensation she's talking that much. Not that much. You could walk away and it's a gold says that's bent legs. Yeah, no. <laughs> Look at that. And you're gonna get back next week your athletes and you're gonna have them down here somewhere. And it'd be bloody the Marx brothers it could, all over it could again. Work there. I mean there is. I've seen no, you laugh, like but I've seen it happen. And in fact the Germans do yeah, it. Yeah, Norris is like that. They are so they strong high. here. They're so so strong. And if you see it on the telly and you wanna do it, you don't go there. Might work though. Go back to this stuff. Yeah, only anyway. if you've got their limbs are straight yeah. and you're taking the special pills they take to do it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't know. Anyway, right. So yeah, I mean that's just it's just I mean this is purely I wouldn't throw, so I was doing this one. I mean I wouldn't throw with my arm like that, but it just it gets the elbow thinking that it needs to be in line and not out here. So it's in a in a stretched position there. It's just it's just literally mobility, it's not not how I would throw. Um then another very, very good exercise. If you don't take anything away from any of this other than this exercise, I think it's quite crucial. For flexibility, you can also add weight to this and use it as a, one of the specific weight exercises that I'll go into next. But it's, it's for opening up your thoracic. So by that, I mean just creating that kind of chest up into the throat. So it's opening up your thoracic, but with your shoulders um, in a rangy position, so one-handed. So all you do is get a normal bench like this and just get a medicine ball and put that between, between your uh, shoulder blades. And then with light weights, if you just want it as a flexibility thing, that you can go to, I mean, I've seen people do this or seen some guys do this with a 20 kilo disc in both hands. And I'd probably go up to, you know, 5K, maybe, you know, probably 5K. And just, I just call it supine windmill, so just, Rotate. I mean, my my, uh, my spine just clicked twice then, but up in the thoracic, so that's got to be good. Clicking's good. It's all you fast wing. No. <laughs> so, and just circling the arm, so it just opens up the thoracic. Much more so than doing it purely on the bench. If you just watch me do it on the bench, then there's no kind of thoracic movement. It's good for shoulders, but not necessary for your thoracic spine. So that's one very good. I'm losing my voice. One good um, mobility exercise that's a great thing to do before you throw, or say the day before. Um, another very good thing to do is just lie off a bench with a, a weight, I'd probably do it with say an 8k dumbbell or something, and just as a stretching routine, just let it drop. I mean when I started doing this at the beginning of the year, my hand was, I mean, my elbow was up here, which is why I knew I was getting elbow problems, because my shoulder was very locked up. I mean, massage does come into it as well. I mean, it's good to get, especially the lats get very tight um, from doing things like pullovers. So if you just lie on a bench and let the arm drop, I mean, I know I've improved there because that's kind of going off the bench, whereas before it was here, relaxed. So now it's kind of the weight's on the floor. And if I had a heavier weight, it'd probably be further down. Um, um, another... Lat stretches, I think, are very, very important. I mean, there's differing views. I think if you went to Finland, a lot of people, I know Kari Hihilani used to say, don't stretch your upper body, but because then you get the plyometric kind of thing. I mean, you might not want to stretch in quite the same way pre-competition, because you want a bit of tension in your upper body, but when I um, 
the day before I throw, I'll just do a lot of lat stretching. So by that, I mean you kind of want a higher thing. But if you just lean off, off a kind of bar or... I mean, hanging is one of the best things you can do for your lats and you feel your whole spine stretching. I know it's a gymnastics kind of thing. Um, so both, so hand or thumb down, first of all. You'll just feel it stretch there. If, you're on, if you've got bars, high bars, if you hang off a bar and let your body kind of hang down as well, then you get stretched all the way down through this area, which is great as well. So thumb down, thumb up, you'll feel different muscle groups being stretched, um, hanging, anything for the back of your shoulders, because then ultimately you can get more hit off the top and kind of flexibility that way. I mean, my medial rotation, that's the next thing I want to come on to. That's, that is... Um, that's beneficial for the medial rotation. So when I start, went to physio, when I first started back training, my physio calls it sleepy stretch. So you wanna, don't wanna stick your arm out there because then it's, it is quite flexible because your shoulder's popping out. But if you set your, your shoulder so it's underneath, underneath you and then just push down with the other arm. I mean, I could literally just get to there at the start of the year. So, I mean, my medial rotation isn't very good. Whereas the other way, it could go down through the ground but just hold that for probably a minute which is a long time and and just and you can do push against the hand and then and then relax and do the pnf things which i'll come on to with more throwing specific and just hold that before you throw because then um you're able to get most people here or any athletes will be very flexible that way but it might not be that flexible when you release there is a bit of a balance and, you know, my physio says you don't want a lot of, meat, like, a, a massive amount of medial rotation because you need some kind of back to the shoulder strength, otherwise your arm will, you'll get shoulder problems. And yeah, can, can I things. just talk about that? Mm. The, just, just very briefly, uh, Goldie mentioned it earlier about the, uh, <coughs> the sort of the medial rotation, the internal rotation. Shoulder injuries basically occur because the, the braking system is, is insufficient to deal with the speed of the release. So when, <coughs> when coaches say to me, there's, um, I think I've got, they've got a really fast arm, it's almost like incumbent that they haven't got the sequencing right in the throw because you're, you're seeing the speed of arm as opposed to the connection of the rest of the body. And the second thing is almost, almost certainly indicative that the braking mechanisms, the mechanisms into internal rotation are poor because the back of the shoulder. And the shoulder surgeon, you only find these things out when you see soldiers. Yeah, so I'll, I'll say two things. The shoulder surgeon Ian, Ian Bailey did Steve's and Nick's back in the early 90s. Basically said, imagine that your shoulder blades are, you know, in control of the horse, yeah? And you've got the reins in your horse, and that they're constantly being challenged. If there is a weakness at any point in the rear of the shoulder, you'll lose control of the horse. And that's effectively what happens. So the back of the shoulders, and Goldie's already said it, and I'll say it again, the rear of the shoulders, the teres major, teres minor, subscapularis, are absolutely crucial and particularly crucial because we've got a breed of children now sitting at a computer desk who've got really poor posture so you know the shoulders aren't back where they should be to start off with nowadays so if you don't build into your sessions this sort of stuff but more importantly all the stuff at the back of the shoulder you're going to have kids who have shoulder problems and we did something a long time back which we call gambetta Gambetta exercises, I'll show that. which is which, well, you'll show that, right? Yeah, so I won't say any more about that. And we did that in the squad sessions, and it's good fun. You can have a laugh, <coughs> uh, and, and you can do you can graduate it and complex it and make it as more difficult as you like. But it is the internal rotation of release that snags your rotator cuff in the end because the rear of the shoulder can't cope with the demands of deceleration. All right? Good. Yeah, I'll do some actually. I'll grab a pot. I can do some right. gambetta stuff. Um, because this is just a pure kind of mobility um, again so another thing for because obviously you want to get in a very hyper extended position with your back when you throw another thing that you can add into it's just been very disciplined in warm-up routines because it was something that mark was always used to watch me warm up for throwing and was always a bit like not convinced that it was um dynamic enough for throwing because static stretching isn't always great so this is i just call a um home crucifix so Funny, you may well do it so it's his hand out straight just to encourage hyper extension and just the other to the opposite hand. So you and then you can hold some, I'll do say 20 before a throwing session, and then you get that hyper extension <laughs> really push up. I and mean, with my back problem, I have to get my mark to um, uh, just push on my uh, each vertebrae just to mobilize them. Oh, well, I shouldn't have to do that. 
a while, but that was just the, my problem was in uh, hyperextension. And then this is something I got off Steve um, or Pospisils um, on the floor. It's, um, it's partly kind of a yoga thing. Um, if you put your uh, elbows on the floor and then it's just mobilizing the spine basically, hands to the same way as your feet. So in a C shape, it mobilizes your spine um, sideways and then the cat stretch on your hands. So look up and then down again. Happy cat, I'm a happy cat. Yeah. So those <coughs> kind of specific mobility things. And another great one for actual kind of javelin position is just with a javelin in your hand, just very relaxed. Weight on your, your right leg, pre-bent. Um, and then swing up into the javelin position, hip in. And then you're pushing with that hand and pulling with the other hand to create a similar kind of tension that you want to feel when you throw. So doing that before you throw is at least getting you into the specific yeah. positions without throwing. And then and the thing I was talking about earlier, throwing front on. So from there, left, you want to have your left arm up, sight line. Working on my chin was quite crucial last year when I came to withdraw with the javelin, making sure this chin was back, because that seemed to set up the left shoulder as well. So just throwing front on from there, so up over the top and then go to side on then uh, jump cross over in and then on to five strides seven strides jog in so there's always and i still start like that now so it means you can do 60 throws a session and it won't be very damaging but you're still um kind of educating decent positions and basically all these specific weights exercises i'm going to come on to is about getting strong through your hips. So a lot of it looks very damaging and dangerous. But you're not hyperextending extending your back, you're putting the pressure through your hips and it doesn't touch your back if you do it properly. <coughs> um, so coming on to the specific weights exercises. Um, and there's hundreds you could do and you can make up your own. But the Oh, we haven't got any power bags, have we? Sure. Sure. Uh, Can I just grab a light? I call this a jab bar hit, but interpret it however you want. I mean, this isn't probably the name of it, but with an EZ bar, this is kind of the shortest bar I could find. It's just within a circuit. There's probably, I think I've got about 15 exercises here. Um, just in a javelin position, but you're, it's obviously heavier than a javelin, so I'd go up to... Um, a knee Z bar, so I'd probably do say 15 kilos or something. So it's just like the javelin thing. So relax, swing down, and then up. And if you do it in a mirror, it's really useful. Um, you're not wanting to get, because the heavier you go, often you'll get stuck at the back and not be able to get in and out of that position. So it's in, over, and down. And so just do 10 of those. And it's just um, relaxing, not having too much weight on that right leg again. Um, and then just continuing on that's double handed and obviously throw single handed it's great if you've got a mirror in a gym I mean I'm lucky enough to have one there and there so I can see it side on and front on same thing again but with discs so so just another ten of those but like John was saying it's not a kind of flexed elbow so as much as my elbows going over at the top, you don't want to bring your hand in with it, so it's creating range with your hand, but your elbow going over the top. And this the weight in your left hand makes you more aware of your left arm being there and not kind of coming away when you throw. So that's the jab disc hit, I call it. Um, something, um, for some reason, has been filtered down to me. There's a loosest drill, which is exactly the same thing again but with a disc, so it's just disc over and down, and that's called loose sit drill. Yeah, and, and the benefit of the double-handed <coughs> is, you know, it's like, it's like medicine balls double-handed. What it does give you, it does your great left side, or right side if you're left-hander. 
So, you know, the reason doing it, Golf just said it, is that it gives you connection so that if you are, you know, you, you don't lose the left side. It's, it's, if somebody consistently technically drops the left side, it's again a good preparation to get that into your system. Um, this is a great one for hips, well they all are really, but um, this can either be an abs exercise or just a, a time, it's very good for timing, so separating your hands and your hip, so it's just down, hip first. So if you know, a lot of people I've seen do it, and will just do it like that, and there's no separation between the hand and the hip, so it's down, hip first, then on, hip first, then on. So you feel that real pull and timing. You can do that, so keeping it the same level there, or you can go from low to high, so that kind of gets your length and kind of abs involved. And then if you want to develop that on, you can do that also with, I call it jab hip hits with the bar, or you can do it single arm. So it's, it's discus basically, but you are getting your hips involved and ahead of your arm, as you would when you throw. Um, a good abs exercise, I haven't actually done this one before, is if you get your legs involved as well, and the legs are doing the work, and it, the core is stabilizing what the legs and arms are doing. So it looks like an arms exercise, but you won't use your arms or feel your arms at all. So it's down to the floor, then lift up with your hips and your abs. And then over the top. So you do really feel that through, through your um, abs and not your arms. So that's a very good abs exercise at the end of a weight session if you make the bar a little bit heavier. Rather than doing crunches with the weight, put that in and I believe that will be a much more uh, challenging. Um, then um, just prone windmills, which is very good if we're talking about, um, sorry my colour's coming up now, if we're talking about stabilising shoulders, then this is <coughs> kind of a crucial exercise. But whenever you do this, you just want to set, it's very easy to do it and lift your scapula up and use your traps and that's not the idea so you always want to be in that position so scapula in and down so it's just lying on a bench again and people look at you funny in gyms and think you're a swimmer but just start start from underneath the bench set your scapula then go up in front of you and touch the touch the disc in front and then behind you back and you can do that with one and a quarter discs, and that is fairly challenging, even though it's very, very light. <laughs> and another good thing with uh, shoulders, the two key shoulder exercises that I've kind of whittled down, so much stuff that I've been given over the years, because I've had, you know, shoulder impingements like everyone else. You know, you can do rotator cuff. My rotator cuff's very, very strong now from doing the band work and stuff with discs. But the two exercises that I do kind of twice a week, and probably will do for the rest of my career, is just really easy. Um, just reverse flies, but, but making sure you're doing them with your thumbs up. So set your scapula again, and you should feel it at the bottom of your uh, shoulder blade. Thumb up, and just lift up, and hold at the top. So three sets of 10 of that. So ideally with dumbbells because it's easier to kind of get your thumb up. And then the other one, what do you call those? Uh, reverse flies. So although it's lightweight, it's very challenging. And at the same time, as soon as you feel like we see an athlete with shoulders doing that, which is very easy to do because of bench and everything else. And I do like that. It's just making sure they're set and back. So you should then find that they're at least in the middle somewhere. They're never going to be right back there. Dumbbells. And the attention to detail is the thumbs up. Yeah. There's no point doing this, you do it thumbs up. So you walk away from it and do that exercise. If you don't take thumbs up away with you, no point in doing it. Yeah, because there is another kind of big muscle um, group exercise. So bench pull, so it's upside down bench press, however you want to call it. So lying on the bench like that. If you do it with your hands uh, over the top of the bar, then you tend to recruit your lats or, sorry, your um, my brain's gone. 
so off the shoulder anyway. But if you have your thumbs down, you can't do as much weight, but you're getting the bottom of your uh, scapula. And um, we'll be able to set your scapula in and won't get as many shoulder problems ultimately. And the other exercise with the reverse flies is what I just call protraction re retraction, which I was trying to demonstrate on the floor in the gym. So it's kind of a press up position and just push as far as you can and hold with your scapula out and then in as far. And you, when you do it, you feel your scapula touch basically at the bottom. So that's what I just call protraction retraction and strengthen the back, back of the shoulder as well. Um, okay. And like I was saying before, the supine windmills, so the ones on your back, which is a flexibility exercise with the medicine ball, you can do as a specific weights exercise and do with, I know Mark's done it with 10, 15 kilos, both arms. If you want to really strengthen it, then you can do the same exercise with say a 5 k <coughs> weight. Then if we go on to um, Gambata exercise, Ben Gambata from the States, um, his whole thing was shoulders. And uh, there's lots of this you can do. I don't do so much of this now. I mean, I found that it, when I had shoulder impingement problems, it would hurt it, so I didn't do quite so much of it. So some people find it's great and works the backs of your shoulders. I found that it kind of hurt the front of my shoulder a little bit but it's worth doing and just seeing so when i was younger i remember at school actually going up and down the sports hall when i was about 17 for hours just doing all this stuff so like the first one you can just go side to side and um, you want to keep your uh ass down so not up here because then you're not using your core as well but just so side and then back the other way then you can do crossing over your hands and back. You can then do forward and so forward and so, back, yeah. so forwards and back. So and then another one which is quite good for awareness as well. I've got a cold there in mind and I can't balance. But it's rotation oh, one, which is quite good as well for just general coordination. And then the stuff I put in the circuit is. Um, up and down on boxes which kind of gets your shoulder a bit out of range as well so if you get like a step box or something in any gym and you can just go up onto it and you just see gymnasts doing all sorts of this kind of thing and then you can start one side and go up and down sideways you can do the same thing again so you, you cross over your hands uh, so there's just hundreds of things you can do, but it's all very good for kind of core shoulders, and it's kind of a preventative type of training. Can I, can I just say something? Like a lot of you will be working down a club night with ten athletes who you're going to pay general attention to. <laughs> that built into the preparation warm-up phase before you do the main exercise of the evening would, would save <coughs> a lot of shoulders if they're not hurting already, and secondly. It Kids who now are prepared for something in normal play, it would give them a background which they haven't got. So, you know, if you take nothing else away from this weekend, that as a fun relay race opportunity, uh, speed opportunity in terms of going sideways in teams of two or three, whatever, it's a great warm up mass sort of. But the key is, and I'll, I'll say this, I was going to say at the end, but to do it properly and correctly and technically yeah. astutely. So Basically you just do want your ass down. Everything in proper position, absolutely crucial. You know, don't be sloppy on attention to detail on how you do things. Um, okay, and the, another one looks quite damaging. I know full well, and I've seen it, that Menendez can do this with 40 kilos, so 10 kilos on either side, and they do quite a lot of it, the Cubans. Um, but I call this Kari, as in the national coach, Finnish coach, Kari Snatch. Um, so I'm not sure if this is wide enough bar, but Basically, it's like doing the mobility exercise as you would with a javelin, but doing it with a bar. So it's just over and behind. <laughs> so you're, you're kind of using your hips as well, so it's not... But you can add more weight to it. So I can do that with by well, a 20k bar, but I've never really tried much more than that. If you went for kind of 10 reps. And you can also do it as kind of a mobility thing. You can do it. It's not the same kind of action because your shoulders aren't quite as fixed but you can do 
um, hit with discs. So that's quite good because it gets your hips in as well. And then um, some kind of ab type exercises, which are just a bit different to um, the normal ones, weighted exercises. If you get an Olympic bar, obviously with a bit older athletes, and just put it over your, uh, just do it around this way, over the back of your head. And then it's, it's opposite arm to opposite leg. So you're wanting to, to um, basically create some tension because the bar's going to be swinging that way. And you want to stop it and then move it back. So that way and then that one. So you get into a bit of a rhythm, but you are using your uh, abs quite heavily. And another good abs exercise, I've caught my shoulders doing it once before. So you don't want to do it too vigorously, but with another bar. So it's just sit up and press. I can't know why I keep on So, but kind of push your shoulders, so it's kind of flexibility as well. Um, um, another great exercise, I think, is bar rollouts, which I'm sure you may have seen. Uh, Um, so it's good for scapular control again, but obviously great fabs as well. <coughs> so this can be built in. So it's just going out, down and back. I mean, if you start kids off and you can go to here, they've still got to control it. But with more um, developed athletes, you can yeah. go into single hand dumbbells if you get dumbbells in both arms, and then you've got to control the scapula as well. Um, so they're very good for abs. Um, what else have we got? Uh, another good one is, um, so there's some, some upper body, some abs, and then lower body. Um, um, if you just have a 10K weight or, uh, so if I use it, you have to do one first walking which kind of simulates the impulse final crossover so you're fixing the position but kind of you can visualize being set up just before you're about to throw 10k weight i need something a bit bigger and just up into that position so it's walking so it's taking you off balance but you're fixing that position and you can go up onto your toe i can't hear what i'm saying so i can't balance very well but um, you can just increase the weight on that and it does get this kind of side oblique as well as being quite specific um, for the throwing. So you can walk up and down a gym, so for 12 steps or so. And then the same thing with, say, I don't know, 5K, 10K weight, however good someone is, just walking lunge with twists. So putting you off balance, so you're having to fight against this weight, that weight that's pulling you the opposite way. So... <coughs> and you're keeping your, your hip facing the same way so you're not twisting with the weight and losing that tension around your hip. And then another one that I've got off Steve, which he really likes, is walking lunge with crucifix. So you're down into a lunge position and then basically you're using your legs to get the weights back up to where they were. So down into a lunge and using the weights to, legs to get the weights back up. So you can go heavy on this or light. But basically, it's always good posture. So if you're losing balance and you want to go down to, you know, even if someone can't do it with just their hands out. Uh, and then just a kind of back exercise. If you've got a uh, hyperextension <coughs> machine, so we haven't quite here. But if I was on a hyperextension machine with my legs or ankles fixed. So actually I could do it. Uh, probably can't. Um, so I'm on a hyperextension machine. So I'm going to simulate it very well. Uh, actually John, can you hold my leg? Yeah. Where do you want me to hold so 
just on my behind my knees or something. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's quite hard. Is that right? <laughs> yeah, that's fine. So then you're half extending, but bringing your arms up at the same time. So you feel your scapula working. So it's not just a hyper, <laughs> hyper extension here. It's uh, using your scapula at the same time as well. Um, and then <coughs> another great ab exercise, um, Russian twist, which you might have seen. I mean, it's very easy on the floor. So if you're, you've got a younger athlete, um, you can just with your feet up on the floor, doing that, which some people call a Russian twist. But you can also do it in a hyperextension seat, bench, whatever you call it, with your feet. If your feet are fixed and there's nothing, there's no bench, so if it was cut off there, then you can really lean back. And so you're stopping it and then pulling it. You can get much more torque but just make sure you're uh, flexible enough because if you start with a lot of weight, you, you can feel your back kind of crack. Yeah. <laughs> it's no weight really to start, it's just a movement. Yeah, it? just do the movement to start with. Um, so there, some of the specific weights thing. Another thing that I found really transferred from what I was doing in the gym into throwing and just some little kind of small exercises at the end of weight sessions which would act as kind of core exercises at the end of uh, weights was just a few exercises that Mark used to do with a power bag. Um, uh, the first one, sweating. Uh, the first one, I am, it's my sleeve coming out. Um, the first one, I mean, I, I use a, I think, 15k power bag in um, the season, but start with I know, something very like, so 5K or something. So you start, it's called a diagonal. But basically, all these are creating range and working your abs in an extended way because a lot of people do crunches, <coughs> crunches and flexed abs, but you never ever, unless you <laughs> throw like that, you never ever use your abs in that way. So you always want length, lengthened, extended torque through your abs in a kind of diagonal, lengthened position. So these are great for that. So. The diagonal one is starting with a power bag there. You want to use your hips again, so a bit like those um, kind of high bar hips, up and then hold at the top. So up and hold. And if you've got a 15k power bag, that is quite hard to hold at the top because it's moving around everywhere. So up to there and hold, and then down the other side, hip first, hip up and hold to the opposite side. So you're getting massive stretch right the way up through your body um, and another kind of static strength uh, one because these are unstable they're quite a good training tool is opposite I think I call it what do I call it I just call it jab position so get in a kind of standing throw position sweet it's a kind of backwards javelin throw um, how I think of it so sweep down and up into that position. And if you think with a heavy power bag, it's quite difficult to hold. So up into that position, I think I've got quite a short base. Um, and you're kind of moving around here, but it's great to try and hold and then go down the other side. So left-handed, up into that position. And I, I'm, I'm pretty convinced that those kind of things help me hold a position at the end of a run-up. And the last one, which is great for connecting that into throwing is just, I mean, I'd get Mark to stand where John is and catch. Um, so, same thing again, you want your hip first, but because it's heavy, I mean, this isn't great because it doesn't put me off balance too much. Um, it's putting you off balance because it's 15 kilos and you've got 600, whatever, 800 grams. So, down in, <coughs> hip first, and then throw. And we do sort of three sets of each side and it is really really tiring um, so yeah and it's great because you like Mark will say you know try and hit me harder or try and hit my head or yeah so and it's good good motivational tilt tool as well um, so so down in 
and with me, I'm not sure if I'm doing it great today, but when I do it, I wanted to try and create or educate my right hip to go up and not drop down, because that obviously takes the chest with it. So I'd start, this is why this pre-bent knee is very important. If it's straight like that, then the only place you can go is kind of rock down onto your left leg, and then your ass will go backwards and it'll hurt your knee probably. So pre-bent right knee, swing down, hip low to high. So you want to finish there with hip going up. Then you can get your chest up and into the throw. Um, so those were the three. There's loads of power bag exercises. <coughs> and you can do cleans with them because it's unstable, but ultimately I think they're much more specific and a lot better. Um, and the... Uh, that, the overhead shot exercise I was talking about earlier. Oh, I actually haven't done one. We, this is a, a very good um, exercise for conditioning an athlete to do the overhead forward shot. And when I was talking about overhead forward shot, um, before, I'm like, I think Dave's got a few K shot and I can do it into that net. Finish. I haven't started doing it yet this year. But, um, if you want to do that with a medicine ball, uh, first of all, I'm talking about the overhead forward shot, which I'll do in a second there. If you, in medicine ball throwing, you can start sitting on a bench. And when I see people doing medicine ball, I always see people with bent arms. You want to create a lot of range in your thoracic, which is why doing that mobility exercise on the med medicine ball to open it up is so important. So start seated, then you can move on to throwing um, with uh, sorry, kneeling, and you really want to get your hip into it. So I did have very um, weak glutes a few years ago, which is why I hurt my knee. And um, so you really want to squeeze those and get into a very long range position, and then hip first, and then arm. Um, and then you can move on to standing medicine ball throw. So from here, and then basically you want to get in and out of position as quickly as possible. And when you first start doing it, a lot of people will be very um, off balance. And you basically want to, I'll uh, quite some time. Um, basically, the, oh wait, sorry, out of sync now. A good specific weights exercise for this is getting an Olympic bar or I mean, it's obviously if you've got young kids, you want a light bar like this. And it's basically creating that inverted C that I'm talking to Steve talk about. Um, it's creating tension and uh, strength through your hips. It'll look like I'm going to hurt my back, but it doesn't touch my back. If you put all the pre-bent knees again, tension through your hips. So you're just going down, and you want to... I'm all off balance because it's cold. Um, you want to try and touch your heels. So you can do that with a broomstick. You could do it with a broomstick, you could, but it actually helps having a little bit of weight. Yeah. <coughs> so I'd do it with Olympic bar, 25 kilos. So that's a good, a good specific way. It's, it's called a, I think, I called it a body bow. I'll be back.